All right, John chapter number 12. We've got a lot of verses to go through tonight. I'm going to, I have to skip over some of them. I even have it in my notes that we are going to be skipping some of the content here in John chapter 12 just because it's 50 verses and there's a lot of doctrine here and we're limited on time. But that being said, let's dig into this real quick here. Now we just saw last week in John chapter 11, <coughs> Lazarus being brought forth from the dead, Lazarus being resurrected. So this happens now after that. It's getting real close to Passover. Now it's getting real close to the time of Jesus Christ's uh, betrayal and death. And the time is coming. And we see here that right before the Passover, they go back to Bethany, which is the place that, that Lazarus and Mary and Martha live. That's where, where, they, where they stay is in Bethany. And they come back to Bethany. And it says there that they sat down for a supper in verse 2. And Lazarus was there eating with them at the meal. Verse number 3 says, Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Now, um, we're going to spend a little bit of time on this story right off the beginning. Of you know they're sitting down at dinner, and Mary comes with this with this um, ointment, and anoints Jesus' feet. And remember, before she was crying and wiping the feet his feet with uh, with her tears and with her hair. Well, now she's doing this with ointment. And we see here Judas Iscariot. Now keep your finger in John 12. We're definitely coming back here. But flip if you would to Matthew 26. We're going to see another account of the same exact story in Matthew 26, because here we see that. It singles out Judas Iscariot. It says he's the one that says, you know, why wasn't this, why is this big waste made? Because it's real costly, real expensive ointment. You know, it's like a perfume or whatever. That just, it's, it's really costly, really expensive, kind of extravagant ointment. And she's wiping Jesus' feet with, with the ointment. And, you know, Judas has indignation and he says, you know, you know, we could have sold this for, you know, for uh, 300 pence and, you know, given it to the poor. Why, why shouldn't we do that, you know, and help out these poor and these needy? That's what we should be doing. But see, Judas was a hypocrite. Judas was, was a devil. Judas didn't care about the poor. And that's what the Bible even says. Where he says this, he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. So Judas sees, he's just looking at this and all he sees is, Hey, here's a way for me. I could have made more money on this. So he gets angry because, um, you know, he could have stolen some of that money if they would have sold it and, and you know, used it to, to feed the poor or whatever. And this is a great picture of how a reprobate works, of how a false prophet looks like and the things that they look. They look good on the outside. Right? Judas is saying, oh, it's for the poor. And, you know, their message just sounds great. Like, oh, he sounds real devout and real caring in that we shouldn't be just wasting this ointment. We should be helping out those in need. And on the outside of the platter, oftentimes the false prophet's going to look good. They're going to say things that, you know, you can't, you kind of, you can't argue with because, well, yeah, of course, who doesn't want to help the poor? But their real agenda is destruction and thievery and and it's not his heart is not with the poor but he doesn't care about the poor at all he cares about himself and the only reason he even said that is just a facade it's a it's a you know a, a way to trick people into just him being able to steal more money and that's the way satan operates he's he's deceptive he puts up an image and wants you to to get to wants to gain your trust by a, by an image that's why sin always looks attractive. He'll make it look good. Something that really draws you in to make you want to be a part of that. But inside there's death. The wages of sin is death. That's what sin has for you. But Satan tries to dress it up and make it look real pretty and try to deceive you that way. False prophets do the same exact thing. They try to look good and say the right thing. And in their heart they're full of, of wickedness and dead men's bones. This is how Judas operated. But this is real interesting because... We find out different pieces of information in the Gospels, and it's real. If you, want to, if you want to get into studying your Bible, a good place to start is in the Gospels and start comparing 
the same accounts of stories with each other because you'll learn a lot that way when you start to see, oh, here's pieces of information that, that we didn't get from this chapter, we didn't get from this account. And in Matthew 26, we're going to see a slightly different, it's, it's all the truth, it's all the same story, and all of these things happen, but we get a little bit of more information. Chapter 26 of Matthew, look at verse number 7. It says, There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. So, he didn't just have his feet anointed, he also had it poured over his head, right? We got that from John 12, that, that, and, and that it was Mary in Matthew 26, it's just a woman. We don't know who it is, but John 12 tells us we know that that's Mary who does this. But then look at verse number 8, it says, But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Notice the difference here. It doesn't say anything about Judas. It says his disciples. It says they had indignation. So it's, it spawned, it started with one man. It started with Judas saying this. But then the others kind of jumped on the bandwagon here because you see here they had indignation. His disciples started to repeat what Judas was saying and said, hey, yeah, wait, wait, you know, that is real costly. We should be helping the poor with that. We shouldn't just be going around and wasting it and just dumping it all over Jesus' head. Which, I mean, Jesus rebukes him and corrects him that it was done for his burial. It was done for a very good reason. Now, what I want to point out about this is that you need to do what's right regardless of what other people may think or say about you. Now, obviously the disciples thought that, that it would have been right to do this, but they were rebuking Mary and they shouldn't have been doing this for doing a good work. There was nothing sinful, there was nothing wrong with, with the gift and, and, and with what she was giving unto Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. It was in her heart to, to, you know, to, to anoint Him with this costly, expensive oil that she had and, and to honor Him and to, you know, and to pour it on His head and to wipe His feet with her hair. Don't go around rebuking people for things that aren't sin, for one, especially when they're doing things that are good. There was nothing wrong with what she was doing. Yet they all kind of jump in on Judas's bandwagon of being so concerned about the money that you could have given to the poor based on that thing. It's, you know, this, this focus on money is, is ridiculous anyways. But it only took, again, a little leaven leaven at the whole lump. That leaven of Judas was rubbing off on people. And we see that in Matthew 26. Now, thankfully, in John 12, it tells us that specifically it, it stemmed and came from Judas Iscariot. But you can see how it's easy to get caught up in this. And you need to be, be careful because even being around good, godly people, you can get caught up in a false belief or a false notion that stems from someone who's not godly at all. So just because you have a group of people who are, who are good Christians, I mean, look, no one would dispute that the disciples of Jesus Christ, ex except for Judas Iscariot, were, were great men of God, godly Christians. They were devoted. They followed him. They never turned their back on him. I mean, except not to this point. They were, they were doing all kinds of good work. They were people that you'd probably want to listen to. I mean, if you had the opportunity to listen to, to the Apostle Peter, or James, or John, or you know any of the disciples, wouldn't you like to just hear what they have to say and, and learn from them because of all the time that they spent with Jesus Christ? Of course you would. But no matter who the person is, when you know that you're doing right, Mary knew that she was doing right. There was nothing wrong with what she was doing. Don't let the criticism of others, when you know you're serving God, when you know you're doing His will, don't let that detract from what you're doing. There's a lot of naysayers out there that'll discourage you from, from going soul winning and, and knocking on doors. Hey, look, don't let that get to you. And may, there may even be some good men of God that are doing good work in other ways. They're probably not if they're not going soul winning. Maybe that's not the best example. But there could be other things that you're doing um, that, that someone else, they don't agree with the way you do it or, or whatever. Um, don't let that bother you. Just keep doing what's right because we see Jesus' reaction to this um, in Mark 14. You can turn there if you'd like. Mark 14 is another um, account, but we see Jesus does something very special because she did this for him. 
and she was getting rebuked. And also, you know, don't jump on that bandwagon just because there's a bunch of people. You know, think for yourself and, and judge righteous judgment. Don't be so swayed when, when someone says something, because especially if it's a Judas Iscariot, you may not even, they didn't know that Judas was a Judas. They didn't know that he was a traitor. They didn't know that he had a devil. They didn't know that he wasn't a believer. And they allowed him to influence them to the point to where they all kind of got on Mary's case here. But in Mark 14, in verse 5, we're going to see the same example. It says, For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. So they're murmuring and complaining about what Mary did for Jesus, which they shouldn't have been doing. And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. So Jesus is correct. We say, look, don't trouble her. Don't, you know, don't be murmuring against her. She did something good, a good work for me. So obviously, is what, is what Mary did a sin in any way, shape, or form? Of course not. Jesus said, she hath wrought a good work. She has done a good thing unto me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good, but me ye have not always. And that's an important truth. Look, there is always going to be poor people in this world. It, I wish our government could understand that, and I wish people who believe in all this communism and socialism and all this other garbage trying to make everybody equal, it will never happen. There's always going to be poor among you because there's always going to be people who don't want to work or who are who are in a very bad situation from you know, health reasons or something else. There's always going to be people like that. Um, and he says you can always do them good. They're always going to be around. You can always go out and do good and help the poor. And he's not saying not to do that, but he said, look, me you have not always. So don't get on Mary's case for doing this. It says, she hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily, verily, I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. So not only does Jesus set them straight, but he says, okay, look, every time, wherever this gospel is preached, she's going to get a little bit of honor here now for doing this and for standing up and for not listening and, and, and caring about their criticism of her, but just doing this nice thing for Jesus and helping anoint his body for the burial and doing a good work on him, you know what? This is going to be remembered now. And it is. And it's in the pages of our Bible. I'm preaching about it tonight. The gospel is preached here and we're, we're preaching about this good work that Mary has done. And, and what she has done has been preached throughout the whole world. I believe that. It's a memorial for her of what she did for Jesus Christ. So don't, you know... Jesus will honor you. Jesus will regard the work that you do. If you know that you're, you're doing good by Jesus, try not to let these people who want to criticize you for serving God discourage you from doing what you're doing. If you know what you're doing is right, if you know you're doing a good work for Christ, don't let these people discourage you. Because God, if you receive all that criticism, just you know, be happy about it. Because God will make sure that you're rewarded for the things that you do anyways. And... Um, he did that right here for Mary. So let's go back to John chapter 12. And I already touched on this in, in verse 8. He says, The poor you have with you always. Again, in John 12, um, they, they will always be around and we can always help them. But Jesus is not always around, which is why uh, Mary did what she did. Verse number 9, Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Now this is real interesting because here we see, I kind of went into this a little bit last week, but people hear about Lazarus being raised again from the dead, and that's, that's quite the event. Someone being, being brought up back again from the dead, a lot of people wanted to go and talk to him. So they're sitting at dinner, and a lot of people came, and a lot of people came not even, not even just to see Jesus, but they wanted to see Lazarus and be like, man, what was that like? And it was, it was so shocking, and it had impacted so many people so much 
that the chief priests were starting to talk about, like they had already been talking about Jesus Christ putting him to death because of all the miracles that he did. And they were saying, look, people, you know, the whole world's believing on Jesus Christ. We need to put a stop to this. And they concocted a plan to that he needs to be put to death. Well, because of the miracle they did with Lazarus, that caused so much of a stir in and of itself. And so many people wanted to be, wanted to see Lazarus and hear about it. They were hearing so much. It had such an impact on people's lives that now they're talking about killing Lazarus too. Like, we got to kill both of these guys because this is having way too much of an impact and they needed to stop people from believing it. That's why it says in verse 11, because that by reason of him, talking about by reason of Lazarus, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. So when they saw the the miraculous event was true and they saw that it happened it was just like you know of course they're going to believe now that why wouldn't they believe that jesus is the christ he's the son of god to have the power to bring somebody back from the dead and um so we see here that the that the chief priests they want to kill lazarus as well and then um, let's keep reading here in verse number 12 on the next day much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. Now, we have such an advantage today having the New Testament already written down and we can study all of these words and all of these words of Jesus and we could go back and compare that to the Old Testament and really get all this information. The disciples didn't have that luxury. So events are happening and this is happening in real time. They're not always thinking back to all of these prophetic scriptures, but it's interesting how they, they were able to recognize this later. And this is a quote when it's talking about the um, fear not daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. This is a quote from Zechariah. And, and all of the prophecies that Jesus Christ fulfilled, I'm going to have to put together a sermon. It's going to take me a while, but to, to put together all of these different prophecies that were fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ, because they truly are amazing. And it would be amazing to be in that time and just, you witness and you see these things happen and you don't think about it. But then later on, you know, after the resurrection, later on, you're thinking, oh man, yeah, remember, remember when he came into the city and he was on the ass? That's what they said in Zechariah. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. So all of these things they, they, that, that tie in together that they weren't even thinking about at the time, they're like, of course, later on, they're like, oh yeah, you know, that's amazing. He did fulfill this prophecy. And to go back and think of all of the different things that the Old Testament spoke about, Je about the Christ, Jesus fulfilled all of those prophecies. And it's an amazing event. And we have the luxury, like I said, of being able to go back now and we can see all of the things that happened and, um, and the words of Jesus and go back and compare those things and really take time and study it out. Uh, let's keep reading here. Verse 17 says, The people therefore that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. So they're, they're at their wits and they don't know what to do because they're seeing everybody is going and following Jesus Christ. It's the same predicament they were in before. And they're saying that, look, they, they had this counsel among themselves and they're kind of putting the blame on, on everyone else saying, you guys aren't doing anything. Like, do you see, the, whatever you're trying to do to stop him, it's not working. You're not doing anything. Everybody's still going after him. Verse 20 says, And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came, therefore, to Philip, which was at, of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. 
Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. So this is signifying, Jesus is signifying now that the end of his ministry is, is, is come upon him. There's very little left for him to do. It's to the point now to where the Greeks are coming to see Jesus. And remember, Jesus was sent unto the house of the children of Israel. He was sent in his own house, and that's what he did. He traveled around Israel, but he never went off into the other nations. That wasn't his ministry to do. That was given after his resurrection, and the apostles were told then to go out and preach the gospel unto the whole world. Jesus wasn't here to do that. So when, he's, when word and, and, and everything spreads of Jesus Christ to now the, the, you know, the Greeks or the Gentiles are coming to seek Jesus, it was a sign showing, okay, you know, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And um, it was just that sign that, that things are going to be wrapping up here. Verse 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Verse 27. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Jesus' soul is troubled. He knows what's ahead of him. And that's why he's saying that he gives this parable about, about the wheat, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He knows what his mission is. He knows what he needs to do. He knows he needs to die. And he likens it unto, you know, a seed or a seedling that, that falls to the earth. Hey, that seed dies when it's off of the plant but because of the death of that seed, then it's able to take root and, and bring forth and bring forth abundant fruit. When it falls into the ground and dies, it comes back. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying that he needs to do. He says, my soul is troubled. But he's like, what should I say? Father, you know, save me from this hour. He said, I, you know, I don't like what I have to go and do. My soul is troubled. I'm facing, can you imagine that knowing that you're facing death? Knowing what you have to face, knowing that you're going to go and be ridiculed and be beat up and be nailed to a cross. He knew, we're going to see that a little later in this chapter, we've already seen it before, that he's going to be lifted up from the earth. He knows he's going to be nailed to that cross. He knows he's going to suffer in the way that that type of execution, those people suffer on that, on that cross. And he also knew that he was going to be bearing the sins of the world and pay for those sins in hell. And that is not something to look forward to. That is something that's going to grieve your soul. That's going to, that's going to cause you to, to be troubled. And Jesus was troubled. But he's saying, you know, what am I going to say? What am I going to do about it? See, oh, Father, save me? Because he could have asked, he could have asked God the Father to save him, and he would have done it. It's very clear. The Bible makes that very clear. Jesus could have decided not to do it. But out of his love for us, he, he decided no. He says, this is the whole, my whole purpose for being here. He says, but for this cause came I unto this hour. He said, this is the whole reason for me being here. He didn't shy away from the trouble that was, that was facing him. Because when that time comes, you know, he may have known about it for quite a while. But he's not thinking about it very much. But now when it's coming up and you're like, it's just a few days away, you know that's when it starts to come real, very real. And, it, and it's almost there. You know, he could, have, he could have gotten scared. He didn't get scared. He was troubled, just as anyone would be. It's something you don't want to face. But he said, I'm not going to call on God to save me out of this. He said, this is a, my whole purpose for being here. This is what it all boils down to. And then he says in verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. Because that, that's exactly what he's doing. He's bringing glory and honor unto God the Father's name. Now, we don't know necessarily what God has lined up for us, but it may not be something very pleasant. There's, if, if we truly are in the last days, like I believe we are, um, but let's say we, we only have maybe 10 or 20 years before, before Christ returns. I don't know. But if that's the case, the Bible talks about the great tribulation and people being martyred for Jesus Christ. 
hey, that's not going to be very pleasant. You may know that people are coming for you and that you might have to lose your life and die for the cause of Christ. And that is going to be something that'll, that, that'll trouble your soul. But we're here to bring honor and glory unto the name of, of God, unto the Father. And um, we shouldn't let that steer us off our course from, from what God has planned for our lives. And um, that's why Jesus also says, He that loveth his life shall lose it. So if you're more worried about, about your own personal life, he says you're going to lose it. He says, And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Um, we ought to be willing to give up our lives. We ought to be willing to, to do anything for God. When Jesus said, Father, glorify thy name, in verse 28, then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Verse 29, the people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And if I, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Now, you might look at this and say, how does that signify what death he should die? And he's just saying, if I be lifted up from the earth. But just because you and I may not quite, like, fully understand that, we definitely understand verse 33 explains it for sure that that's exactly what he's talking about. But the people of the day when he made that statement, they understood what he was talking about too as his reference in verse number 34 because then it says, the people answered him, we have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever and how sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So they're saying, well wait, you know, we thought that Jesus Christ lives forever. So why are you saying that, you need to be, that you're going to be lifted up and you know, basically put to death if the Bible says that the law says that Christ abideth forever. So now they're getting confused again. They're trying to say like, well, you know, who is this son of man? Like, what do you, you basically they don't understand what he's talking about. But they did understand that he was talking about him being crucified or him being put to death because they wouldn't have even mentioned the fact that Christ abideth forever and then asked them the question, what do you mean the son of man must be lifted up? So um, they understood at that time. That's exactly what he's talking about. But Jesus knew, and again, this is evidence, he knew what he had to do. He knew that he was going to be crucified. Before the events ever happened, Jesus had that knowledge, he had that wisdom as the Son of God that, um, that this is what his plan, the plan for his life was, was that he was going to die on the cross and pay for the sins of the whole world. Let's keep reading here, verse number 35. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed, and did hide himself from them. Verse 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet, believed, yet they believed not on him that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory, and spake of him. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of time with this. I know I've, I've discussed this already earlier in an earlier chapter, but it's such an important doctrine to understand that there are people that cannot believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why they're reprobate and they're rejected is that they can't believe. Because people would say, well, what if, what if, because you say, well, these people can't be saved because, you know, for example, they'll, they'll, they'll take a passage of someone who tampers with the word of God. Because the Bible says that if someone does that, that their name is going to be taken out of the book of life. Their name, you know, there's no way they'll be saved. Or someone who takes the mark of the beast. They'll say, well, what if someone were to take the mark of the beast and then they believed on Christ? Would they be saved? And the answer is, well, if they were to believe on Jesus Christ, 
of course they would be saved because that's the only requirement for salvation. However, it is not possible for them to believe. And this has been covered actually pretty thoroughly in the Bible. This, this concept of God hardening people's hearts is, is not a new one. And, it's, and I believe it's explained very clearly here. And it's a prophecy that's, that, that's being brought up of Isaiah. And the, and the prophecy comes from Isaiah 53. Um, let's turn there real quick. Because this is, this is a, this, Isaiah 53 is all about Jesus Christ. And this is what's being quoted. Is Isaiah 53. But this doctrine of, of people not being able to believe has kind of gone by the wayside because people have just, just gotten into this attitude and this mindset of just thinking, well, everybody can be saved. Like, you know, because, because they'll take verses that say that the, the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, and say that because God doesn't want people to go to hell and that God wants everyone to be saved, that it is that it still is possible for every single person to be saved. Or they'll say, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And they'll point to verses like that, which, of course, the verses are completely 100% true. God has loved, has loved everybody who has existed or will ever exist. And Jesus Christ died for the sins of every single person who's lived or who will ever live. And people have all had that opportunity to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. But there are points in people's life where it is no longer possible for them to put their faith on Christ. It's no longer available for them to believe. And we get that from these scriptures. But let's go ahead and read Isaiah 53. The Bible says, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Remember, this is exactly what he quoted in John 12. When he just explains, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believe not on him. And again, you know, you, you can't, it's hard to even imagine how a man can do so many miracles and they could see people raised from the dead and they still just don't believe on him. And because a lot of people were believing on Lazarus, we already saw a lot of people were coming, they were seeing Lazarus, they were believing because of that miracle that Jesus Christ did, because it would seem pretty normal for a person to, to see that event and to put your faith on Christ at that point because it's unexplainable. And especially after everything else that he's done. But the reason why, even though he's done all these miracles, they believe not on him. Why is that even happening? Be, he says that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. This is why it's happening, because it's already been prophesied that this would happen, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed, which is exactly what it says in Isaiah 53.1. But let's keep reading Isaiah 53, because we see that this is all in context of this subject and Jesus Christ. Um, so he's asking, you know, who's believed? Who is the arm of the Lord revealed? Verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. This is talking about Jesus Christ saying that, you know, he wasn't some extremely handsome man. He was a normal guy. He was not like extremely in his beautiful body that there's this form of comeliness that says, he has no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. You know, like, oh man, that guy is just so you know great looking, and and you know, like a lot of maybe charismatic leaders kind of have a, a natural beauty about them, and people will look at them and, and kind of be in awe just at their beauty. Jesus was not like that at all. He was your he was your average guy looking is is the form that he took. Verse three says he is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Remember last week we were talking about that in, the, in the, the house of mirth versus the house of sadness. Jesus was a man who was well acquainted with grief. He was a man of sorrows. He cared and loved so much. He loved a dying world. He loves a sinful world. He loved the people of the sinful world and, and, and grieved over their hardness of heart and people not wanting to believe on him and, and offering up himself. It's a very sad event to have all this wisdom and all this knowledge 
and people just reject you and 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 you know that doesn't feel good in and of itself just being rejected you know you are here you come to do something good to someone else and they literally spit in your face and they beat you up and they mock you and ridicule you and all you're doing is trying to help that's the sad thing that's a grieving thing that's what Jesus had to deal with it says and we hid as it were our faces from him he was despised, and we dis esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was doing this for us. He was well acquainted with grief. He was carrying our grief. He was carrying our sorrow with him. Yet we did esteem him as stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. So the people were looking at him and being like, you know, when they were reviling him on the cross and saying, oh yeah, he's a son of God, huh? Well, why don't you come down off that cross? You know, why don't you save yourself? You came to save the whole world. You can't even save yourself. This is how he was treated. When he was bearing the grief and the sorrows of everybody else, that's what he was, he was looked upon. He was, he was they're like, oh yeah, he's cursed of God. Well, the reason why he was cursed of God, he was cursed for your sake. Because he was bearing your sins. It wasn't bearing his own sins. Verse 5, it says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence neither was any deceit in his mouth. Verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. What a great chapter about the atoning death of Jesus Christ and what he did for us, clearly laying it out that he was pouring his soul out to death. He was bearing our iniquity. He was bearing our sins. That's why he came into this world. This is this entire prophecy of Isaiah 53. Jesus fulfills that. And we get this even before his death in John 12 here. But let's go now to Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to see the other part of this prophecy because that was who hath believed our report and, um, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed. And it goes on and on about, about the, the death and the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. But now we're going to see the other part. I'm going to keep reading here in John 12 where he says... Um, Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. Isaiah 6 verse 9 says, and he said, go and tell, well, let me flip there real quick myself. Look at verse number 8, because this is where Isaiah is saying to send him. Isaiah 6 8 says, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. So they said, Look, I'll go. I'll stand up, Lord. Send me. I'll be your messenger. I'll say what you want me to say. And he said in verse 9, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. 
And look at this next part. He says, make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. So first he says, go and tell this. He says, look, you're here. You, know, you can hear, but you, you have no understanding. You don't understand what I'm saying at all. You can see, but you have no perception as to what's going on. They harden their own hearts first. They have, they have eyes, but they can't really see what's going on. And then he says, make the heart of this people fat. So this isn't the people making their heart fat. This is him, him telling Isaiah, make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Because if they did see, if they did understand, and if they did believe, they would convert and they would be healed because that's the promise of God is that once you believe, you are healed, you are saved. And he says, well, we're going to make the heart of this people to not believe, to not be able to do that. And that's what ties it all together when he says, even though he had done so many miracles among them, they still didn't believe. Because of this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 6, he's saying this is exactly what Isaiah was talking about, what God was talking about to Isaiah, that their heart is going to be closed off and that they cannot believe. And then, you know, I've, I've had this question actually raised to me about someone who's worried that they were a reprobate. And it's like, if you put your faith, if you believe on Jesus Christ, you know your heart. I mean, no one else is going to know your heart. If you know in your heart that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then there's no way that you could have been a reprobate ever. Because if you were, if you were rejected, you cannot believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Once that's done, that's done. So anybody listening today, if you've ever had that thought or that doubt or you had a really wicked past and you're thinking like, man, did I push it too far with God? Well, look at your heart right now. Is your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, is that all you're trusting on to save you and you fully trust Him as your Savior? If, if your answer is yes, then you never reprobate. Then whatever you had done in your past, you had never crossed that line. You, you had not rejected God and God did not reject you because if that were true, then you could not believe with your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ. It would have been impossible. So hopefully that helps to, to kind of clear that, that issue up a little bit too. But it needs to be preached and people need to understand that that is the case for some people. That it doesn't matter what some people can see or hear or, or anything, they just won't believe because they've already hardened their heart and God has hardened their heart. And it's impossible for that person to believe just like Pharaoh and just like these Pharisees and these wicked rulers in high places that, that were just bent on getting Jesus Christ put to death, even though they knew everything that he was doing was true. Everything that he did was right. He was coming in the name of the Lord and he was performing all of these miracles and everything he said was coming to pass. Everything he said was right and they, they could hear it, but they still didn't fully understand because their heart was darkened and they could not believe and no amount of miracle that he did would have been enough for them. Even if he would have come down from the cross like they were reviling him and saying, oh, save yourself, come down from the cross. Even if he would have done that, they still wouldn't have believed. Nothing would have been good enough for them because they couldn't. Because their heart was darkened. They had been put over to a reprobate mind and it was impossible for them at that point. And um, we, need to make, we need to understand that and then don't let this teaching go by the wayside because it is important and, and people need to understand if nothing else, I mean, hey, today is the day of salvation. You don't know what a day is going to bring. You can die and at that point you lose all opportunity to be saved or God forbid you become real wicked and just, just follow down in this downward spiral of sin to the point where you just completely reject God and, and push things too far with them and, um, and become a reprobate. But let's, um, let's keep reading. I'm almost done here. We're going to finish up real quick. I'm actually making it through a little bit quicker than I thought I was going to tonight. Um, verse number 42. The Bible says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, 
But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now look, it's telling us very clearly right here, among the chief rulers, so the people in power, and um, it says many believed on him, right? So they were saved. They believed on Jesus Christ. It says, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. So they didn't, they didn't openly go around saying that Jesus Christ was a Savior. And, and again, this proves that people can be saved and not have those works, those outward works that you are always that people always want to judge and look at and say, well, this person can't be saved. If they were saved, they would have been, they'd be talking about Jesus and doing all this stuff. Not if you love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And this is something that you every Christian has to deal with in their own life is what's important to you. What do you care about more? Do you care more about what people think of you than what God thinks of you? And let that sink in. Think, you have to analyze your own life and decide what's important to you. But, hey, you might be saved, sure, because getting saved is easy. You just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. These chief rulers did that. But they were living a pretty comfortable lifestyle, too. And they were had in respect of the Pharisees. And when they were out in the marketplace, they would have the nice titles and the greetings and they would get invited to the fancy parties and they would, you know, people love them and, and they, would, they would get all these extra benefits and if they were to actually confess Jesus, well, guess what? They'd be kicked out of the synagogue. And getting kicked out of the synagogue apparently was a big deal in these days. You remember the, the, the parents of the, of the man that was born blind that was healed, they were afraid to even say that Jesus Christ healed their son because they didn't want to get kicked out of the synagogue. It was a big deal for people back then to say to get kicked out. It'd be like, oh, I don't care. I get kicked out of the synagogue. Well, good. That's the attitude that you ought to have. But I don't know if you fully understand the, the, you know, the, the cultural importance of the synagogue and the community that they had and, and being outcast and ostracized like that within the Jewish community of being booted from the synagogue was a big deal for them in that day. But no matter how big of a deal that is, and whatever the situation may be in your own life, whether you get booted out of some social club or, or not get invited to, fit to maybe even certain family gatherings. Hey, we're not going to invite, um, you know, I'm, I'll never get invited again to an Easter brunch because I always bring up Jesus. Well, praise the Lord if that's like, I mean, people are having an Easter brunch and you're not, you know, you're not allowed to talk about Jesus. So when are you allowed to talk about Jesus, right? But whatever it is for you, and I don't know what it may be. I mean, maybe something at work, maybe some club you're a part of, maybe some extra, you know, curricular activity that you do. You have friends, you know, your sewing circle, your, your men's club or whatever it is that you do. You know, if talking about Christ is going to get you kicked out of that place, well, then decide for yourself what's more important. Do you want God to be pleased with you? Because I think God wants us to preach the gospel to every creature. I think that's what he told us to do. And I think if we are going to go around and preach the truth and preach righteousness, God's going to be pleased with us. In fact, I know that that's what he wants us to do. And you have to decide for yourself, what do you care about more? Do you care more about God being pleased with you and God looking down from heaven and being like, man, my son, my daughter, they're doing a great job. And I am very pleased with what they're doing. Now, this is something you have to keep in mind frequently because you don't hear that audibly. You go through your life and you experience the, the, you know, the sufferings or the criticism and the people that are against you. That is real. You feel that. But it doesn't make God any less real. You just don't necessarily feel that or see that or hear that. But you will. And that's where faith comes into play. We have to understand that, look, you have to have the faith to know that you're pleasing God in the things that you're, hopefully that you're pleasing God in the things that you're doing and that you're not allowing yourself to be dissuaded from serving Him as Mary was because of people who are giving you a hard time about it. Um, and, you know, if she cared more about the praises of the disciples... And again, the disciples were godly men. Here, the Pharisees are ungodly men. It doesn't matter if it's the praise of a godly man or the praise of an ungodly man. If you're doing what's right, don't worry about the praises of man. 
Just to give an example, I mean, there's, there's a lot of great pastors that we know of, right? Faithful Word Baptist Church, Pastor Anderson, Pastor Jimenez, Pastor Romero, all great men of God. If they were all wrong about something, and I'm serving the Lord, and if I, if I knew, if I knew that I, what I was doing was right, but they would praise me if I would not do that, that would be wicked and that would be wrong and that would be a sin. Even though they're all great men of God, but if they, if they were going to come at me that way, you know, I ought to be more concerned about being pleasing in God's eyes than being pleasing in these, in these men's eyes because that's what matters the most. And God's going to look down at that and be, and be upset with me if I were to just say, you know what, I know God wants me to do this, but it's going to ruffle some feathers and I don't want people to be scared. And you know what? That's how a lot of pastors are today with the, with the, the pre-trib rapture doctrine is that they're afraid of what their friends are going to start thinking about them if they were to come out and say something different and say something that's not as widely accepted and that, and that you know, we're in this social club together and, oh, no, don't say that. And whatever it may be, it could be all kinds of different things or different doctrines. Look, you ought to care more about what God thinks and about what's true from the Bible than what anyone else is going to say or think or do about you. The Bible says over and over again, to fear not, fear not, fear not their faces, fear not what man can do unto you. Decide for yourself, who do you care about more? Do you care about what people think about you? Do you care about being well-liked? Do you want people at your job just to like you and, and people all over the place just, just to, to say good things about you and like you and never bring up Christ? Or do you want to actually do what we're supposed to do and please God and be an ambassador for Christ and be a good servant of Christ and, and have him be pleased with you. But um, I'll stop on that point. I'll keep reading. We're almost done here. Verse number 44. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. And th these are important statements because people who like to say, like specifically the Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses, that I don't believe that Jesus Christ was literally God in the flesh. You can't make these statements unless he was God in the flesh. You can't say that he that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. He said, if you believe on me, talking about Jesus Christ speaking, you are believing on God. Now, I believe on Jesus Christ, but I can't say, hey, if you believe on me, then you're believing on Jesus. I, there's no, no one can say that. That would not be a true statement. Jesus can say that about him and about God the Father because he is God. That's the only way that same thing say, oh, they're one in purpose and they have all these little cute things that aren't in the Bible. They're adding words to it because they understand it different, but that's not what the Bible says. Jesus cannot say, like he said in verse 45, and he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. Look, if you've seen Jesus, you have seen the Father. I can't say if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus because... I am not one with Jesus the way that God is one with Jesus. It's, it would be a false statement. You can't, I can't say that. And nobody can say that. But Jesus was able to say that about God because he was. He was one. Verse 46, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. And we've gone over this before too, that this was Jesus' mission, his first coming, was the salvation of the world. That's why he didn't condemn the woman taken in adultery. That's why he didn't go around condemning anybody. Because he came to save the world. He did not come as a judge, he came as a servant. But guess what? He is coming back. And he is going to set up a kingdom. And he is going to be the judge and the ruler and the king for a thousand years on this earth. Verse 48 says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judge him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. And this, 
This is hard for me to wrap my mind around this because there's so much truth with, you think of Jesus Christ is the word. And he's saying, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. And the one that judges him is the word. And Jesus is the word. So, you know, Jesus is the judge, but Jesus is speaking things that were given to him of his father. And God the Father is a judge, and, and the things that he's speaking are truth. And Jesus is the Word of God incarnate, and he's speaking those words as well. And um, all of the words that were spoken by Jesus Christ will bring people into judgment. Because, um, you know, for example, he said, He that believeth on me is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Those words will come back to condemn people. Those words, and you know who gave them those words? God the Father gave Jesus those words. And Jesus spake those words in John chapter 3, John 3, 18. And those very words that he said, whosoever believeth on me um, shall have everlasting life, for example. Those words, they'll justify him. But he says, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Those words are going to come back and condemn people. Whosoever believeth not, you know, the wrath of God abideth on him. Those words will be the condemnation that people have. And it's the words judging. It's Jesus judging. Um, it's, it's amazing how it, how it all fits together. But um, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for the Bible and for your word. Lord, I pray that you would please just help us to have a uh, greater understanding of these great truths. Lord, it's, um, I feel sometimes like it's just, it's something we can barely start to understand with, with our human brains, dear Lord, um, the, the complexity and the, the fullness of your, of your truth and your word and Jesus Christ and the manifestation of the word, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to continue to grow and to continue to understand. God, teach us Every day, we should be reading our Bibles every day, dear Lord. I pray that you would please speak to us and, and instruct us out of your word. God, I pray that you would please help us to have the boldness to know that when we're doing right, when we're serving you, when we're doing a good work for you, dear God, I pray that you would please help us not to let anybody um, dissuade us from doing so, whether they be godly men or whether they be wicked men, dear God. I pray that you would please help us to remain steadfast in serving you and um, not giving way to, to anybody who would try to stop us from doing so. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.